Welcome back to 14. You thought we were done? Ha! We're not done. Far from it. With Shadowbringers still fresh on the mind, I wanted to give props to some of my favorite characters from the expansion. And so, here are my Fab 5, plus one honorable mention, ranked in no particular order. Except for the last. Does that make sense? The last is my favorite of favorites, is what I'm saying. Oh, and this video is going to be filled with story spoilers, so if you haven't finished the MSQ yet, go and do that first, and then come back. Ready? Let's begin. We all deserve happiness, wherever we can find it. You know a character is good when they can sock you in the feels with only a few lines of dialogue. Tesseline's role in the story lasted, what, 30 minutes, an hour tops, and in that short amount of time, she was able to get my eyes watering. Here's a girl who has dedicated her life to caring for those abandoned by the world, giving them love and attention when others would not, and when they get to the brink, she has the unenviable job of euthanizing them, making sure the people she's bonded with can be spared a painful death by transformation. Can you imagine the emotional weight on this girl's shoulders? Every day of her life, she is surrounded by pain and loss. She doesn't have to stay here, and yet here she is, doing her part to ease the suffering, fighting an unwinnable fight and being a beacon of good in the world, only to get brutally cut down in the way she feared most. Someone so young and so selfless deserved better, and that's what makes her such a wonderfully tragic character who I was sad to see go. And if you lay so much as a finger on my sapling, I'll scatter the contents of her bag all over your precious village. Switching gears to a more lighthearted side, Feo Ul. Cheeky and surprisingly blunt, Feo Ul pulls no punches and will not stand for your shit. They will call you out for being the cold, cruel, and heartless adventurer that you are. Which I find to be surprisingly refreshing, since everyone in 14 just loves to kiss your feet and worship the ground you walk on. I can't remember the last time the Warrior of Light felt like they were treading on thin ice. Bad guys? No problem. World ending calamities? Forget about it. Child's play. But facing a small pixie with an attitude, and suddenly it's I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please forgive my impudence, oh mighty branch. For the sheer audacity of having a character that will put us in our place, Fail Ul is a standout and earns a spot on my list. If you had the strength to take another step, could you do it? Could you save our worlds? Yo, watch out. This man's a bad dude. Just kidding. Seriously, how can you not feel for Ardbert and by extension, his companions? They were done so dirty. So dirty. Here's a guy who is just out to protect his friends and to help out the little people, and what happens? He gets blamed for destroying the world. Then, after meeting Lemony Snicket and going through a series of unfortunate events involving being manipulated, again, killing himself, playing the villain, and getting his ass handed to him by yours truly, he is kept from giving up his soul to stop the flood and is forced to walk the first as a lonely ghost for 100 years. What the hell? Did Eiichiro Oda get his hand in here? Because this is the type of dark depressing backstory that feels like it was pulled straight out of One Piece. Give the man a cupcake and give him a break already. I loved Arbert's redemption arc and watching him slowly open up over the course of the story. This is the type of conflicted and complex hero we love. Someone who, despite their achievements, is not above the emotions and struggles that we all go through. It's understandable why he became so jaded and distraught, and seeing him slowly return to his old self and start to believe again put a smile on my face. Sometimes even heroes need saving. From the very beginning, when he first appeared in our room, I thought, this guy needs a friend, and a grade A therapist. And yep, right on two counts. Check, check. Luckily, we were there to set him straight. And let's not forget his interactions with Seto. Remember this? Ugh. That's just quality right there. Quality, I tell you. 
Where's the tissue box? Then, I would ask her about her next adventure. And if she should wish me to be a part of it, oh, how happy it would make me. I will admit, I have a soft spot for martyr-style characters. For anyone who has played Steins Gate, I get a strong Okabe vibe from him. He who silently carries the weight of the world on his shoulders. Whose burden is so heavy, it would break the strongest among us. Yet forward he walks, doing anything and everything to set us on the right path. Even if no one, not even those closest to him, ever knows what he's gone through. At any cost is the creed that Exarch lives by, even if it means sacrificing himself or his happiness. He is an avatar of grit, determination, and resilience, and is an inspiration to us all. Also, he's a smug little shit, and I love it. There's something that makes my heart ache for tragic heroes like the Exarch. They are self-sacrificing to a fault. I wish I could just reach through the screen and give him a hug. Or a noogie and tell him to take a break and grab a beer already. Because you know guys like him never do. They work themselves to the bone, or I guess, crystal, and have no time for fun. And it's this characterization that makes the end of his arc so cathartic and satisfying. He's done it. He saved the world, and after 100 years, he's finally free. Free of his duties and responsibilities, and we get to see him enjoy himself and have fun. And come on, who doesn't just melt when you see this cutscene? Robots, that's who. Remember, remember us. Remember that we once lived. I remember the first time I saw ES. I remember thinking, oh great, another ASEAN who just wants to fuck things up because why not? It's fun. Oh how wrong I was. Up to this point, I was starting to worry that we wouldn't encounter any villains of substance. You know, ones that are wrapped in layers of deep, rich complexity and who would try something different outside of the all too familiar, let's fight. Because let's face it, knowing our track record, you'd think the baddies of the universe would know better than to choose death so readily. And then in comes badass M itself, with his slow saunter and his little hand flick, and what does he do? He offers an alliance. Ding ding ding, you have my attention. M itself is what this series desperately needed out of a villain. A villain who is, more than anything, a tragic hero left with an unbearably heavy burden and responsibility. Hmm, I'm starting to see a pattern of who I put on this list. Can you fault him for wanting to return to the old times? Wanting to see Amarat 2.0, a realm reborn? He's watched the people of the shards for god knows how long, and all they've done is fight and be petty and fuck things up left and right. You can see why he'd think we're in no position to take care of this source, and yet, Still he gives us a chance, even going so far as to save Yashtola for us as an act of good faith. Emmett Selk is just a lonely guy trying to do his job, finding a way to protect the star and bring back the people that he loves. Even though we don't agree with his actions, we understand that the emotions and desires that drive them are the same as our own. So relatable, so tragic, and the best villain we've had up to this point. Completely and utterly fine. Better than fine. Hale and hearty and still alive to mourn those who are not. Who I failed to protect when they needed me most. I've saved the best for last. My queen. I mean, come on. Was it ever any question? Lena, <clears throat> I mean, Captain Lena, checks all the boxes. V, check. Dancer? Check. Scandinavian accent? Check. Strong independent woman with eyes that remind me of Yennefer of Vengerberg? Stop, I can't take it. It's... 
overpowering. The ever reliable, ever faithful captain of the guard struck a chord with me ever since I first encountered her at the beginning of the expansion. But it actually wasn't until this moment right here that I was like, yes, she is the best girl. She reminds me of that older sister archetype. You know, the type that seems to have it all figured out, but underneath the surface, they're just barely keeping it together. Like Sai Nijima from Persona 5. I don't know what it was about this scene, but there was something so raw and real about it that I wasn't expecting. And that's what sealed the deal. Seeing the battle-hardened vet repeatedly reveal her compassionate side to us proves that there's so much more to her than just fighting and discipline. She gets emotional, has outbursts, and expresses worry over those that she cares about, just like we all do. Lena feels so well written, so well developed and actualized as a character, so real in a way that we rarely get to see. And since she was the closest to getting the waterworks started, she, of course, takes the top spot in my ranking. Well, that's it. There's my list. I hope you had fun reminiscing about Shadowbringers with me, and I encourage you to share your favorites in the comments section below. It'll be fun seeing which characters people connected with and were drawn to, and I hope to see the range. Honestly, I wish I had space to put in all the dwarves, all of them, just for making Lolly Ho a thing. Honorable mention number two? Anyways, I'm rambling. Until next time, later.